Thank you for being here. There's a little bit of confusion about what to do with those ballot things that you were handed earlier, uh, but we're asking that the members of our church supply us with five names uh, that you believe would help us to do a good job of studying our bylaws. Uh, and so we're going to extend that another week because some of you didn't have it until this morning. So uh, uh, feel easy. If you want to turn that in to one of our ushers or uh, someone at the door, uh, please feel free to do so. And uh, we'll begin to collect them. And we'll get serious about collecting them next week, all right? Uh, that will be the first of Sunday of November. Uh, November, I mean September. I'm running ahead. I thought a while ago when Brother uh, Gerald was uh, introducing the activities of the day, and he said, your 60th birthday, and I thought, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> but my daughter and her husband back here, uh, if I was 60, she would be very small. <laughs> uh, and there she is with uh, our granddaughter, uh, who is a graduate this year, uh, uh, high school, uh, beginning a career in college soon, and, and so I'm going to pray for Kate. We're, I'm, we're, we're happy especially to have them here. Amen. We have some other friends here that uh, we have not seen in a few years. We're, we're so pleased to have you come and, and be a part of the day with us. Uh, Sixty years ago today, uh, Nita and I decided to uh, declare openly that, uh, that we're going to uh, try to make a home. And God has been good to us and gracious. And we uh, uh, lived many places and seen many things since then. And I thought today, uh, I've been thinking all week, more than that actually, in, in preparation for today, and uh, it's, it's a little bit like the kids used to say when I was in high school, he said, now I stand before you behind you to tell you something I know nothing about. Uh, and uh, so they went on with that, with that jargon for a while. And uh, I want to talk to you today about worship. And I, I confess to you that I know too little about it. Uh, I don't understand all that's involved. Uh, and so I'm, I'm exploring with you a subject that, uh, that I think is very important in all of our Christian lives, uh, and yet something that, uh, that I don't think any of us have mastered in any sense. Uh, we have a long way to go. We have a lot of growing to do. And uh, so I'm, I'm probably going to uh, approach it from that viewpoint this morning. Uh, and remind you about some principles, perhaps, that will be good for us. We've already heard some emphasis this morning. And if you went home right now, or you went to sleep right now, uh, whichever comes first, uh, then, then you, you have benefited from, from being here together for this service. New York has had a crisis overnight. New York had a crisis 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, we came to this church just prior to 9-11. There was a crisis in New York City. And uh, so we're, we're experiencing something not quite so drastic this time, uh, but certainly reminding us of, of those days. We have loved this church dearly for these years. I will never forget some of the dear people who were here, some of you are still here, uh, who received us graciously, and, uh, and we have appreciated that so much and, and benefited from it uh, so much. But rather than spending a lot of time reminiscing beyond that, let me remind you about some of my background, and this is, a, uh, this is an experience that I'll always remember. When I was the advanced age of nine years, I sat right over in this side of the auditorium of the country church. My dad 
sat beside me that, that day. He had normally been leading the singing in our church. On that day, he was sitting beside me, which I thought was rather different and strange. Morris Faulkner, one of the young men who was a part of his Bible class, was leading the singing that morning. And there we were in, in the service. I don't remember anybody else who was there, but I remember that circumstance. My dad turned to me at one point in the service and he said, Son, do you love God? I have had occasion to go back to that question many, many times through the years. It's a very basic question. I've thought at times, you know, kids grow up and they come up with ideas that are a little bit different. And, and uh, I've thought at times that, that my dad wasn't very well informed or he would ask me some more profound question than that. I thought maybe that's not the best approach to, to finding out if a person needs the Lord in his heart. But if you remember, Jesus, when he was questioned about what is the most important thing to God, this is what he said. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 22. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher? Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. And if you want to know where Jesus came up with that, with that statement, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 for a moment, and we'll read from verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words, which I am commanding you today, shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals or frontlets on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Jesus quoted some of that text, and then he expanded it. And it occurred to me that what he was moving toward and what he was instructing us about was what is the real essence of worship? You know, we've, uh, we've revised some things through the years. Uh, have, have you become aware that there are fads among church people? Uh, that we, we kind of change terminology once in a while and we, and we move from one emphasis to another. A few years ago, we decided that we would have worship leaders for a generation or so. I always thought that as a pastor of the church, I was supposed to conduct worship and lead in worship. Uh, even if, if a preacher couldn't sing a note, he was still a leader in worship, right? Uh, because we opened the Word of God. But in recent years, we've decided that worship comes before the sermon. And then the sermon is something to endure. Uh, you, you heard me the other day say, the little boy 
was sent to church, and his mother asked him about it later, and he said, uh, well, you know, the show was fine, but the commercial was just too long. Uh, so sometimes we, we hear, hear people place emphasis in different places, and uh, Jesus said that the most important thing in response to God is to love Him with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. What is worship beyond that? I wonder if we can go beyond that. Can we actually get past that concept? Can we improve on that concept? Can we go farther than that concept? Moses, in rewriting the law in Deuteronomy, reminds us that we are to love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. You know, Jesus picked up things from the Old Testament all the time, especially concerning the law. Uh, and uh, a good friend of mine used to say very often, when Jesus picked up something from the Old Testament, he either commended it or he corrected it. Now what he did with this particular statement was that he extended it, right? Love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. And then he said, and there's another one that's very much like it. You should love your neighbor as you love yourself. So what Jesus did was take that principle of honoring God and worshiping God from the Old Testament and extended it, extended it, extending it. I'll get it right after a while. My Irish tongue sometimes get all tangled up. Uh, but what, what he said was, I want you to know this principle, but I also want you to expand this principle beyond your fellowship with God and have fellowship with one another on that same basis. So it occurred to me in, in looking at this passage, and I thought about this uh, many different ways, and, and my thoughts have not come together to crystallize as I would wish that it had before this morning. But the Bible also says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It also says, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. It also talks about no one comes to the Father, or comes to me rather, no one comes to me, Jesus said, unless my Father draws him. That all of these passages contribute to this whole focus of what is our content of worship. What do we rally around to remember our worship? And finally, my stumbling around with this subject, which I know too little about. I came to a passage in John chapter 12. And read from the, the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus. Uh, I've always tried to make it a point when uh, when we want to know the last word about something, make a beeline to Jesus and ask Him. And, and so this is one of those things where I, I finally came around to listening to what uh, He had to say. Verse 27, John chapter 12. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. The first thing that seemed to occur to Jesus was, what am I supposed to do? Shall I say, release me from this responsibility? Shall I not follow through with what I know to be true? And so he asked it in the form of a question. Would you release me from this burden? 
this dread, this death. But then he said, it was for this very purpose that I came to this hour. Therefore, Father, glorify your name. What do we mean by worship? When we say we worship God, what are we conveying by that? Well, some scholars have said we recognize the fact that God is worthy. And because he's worthy, we remember his name. But perhaps it goes even deeper than that. And Jesus said, this is why I came. This is my purpose for being here. Therefore, Father, you glorify your name. We're working with this text and it keeps recycling itself in my mind. <coughs> Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You remember that one from Philippians 2? For it is God who is at work in you both to decide or to will and to accomplish that which pleases him. What is worship other than recognizing that God is at work in our own life and in our own heart? Could it be that when we worship God, then we're recognizing who He is and where He's at work? Now, there's a sense in which, of course, not only does God work in our own heart, in our own conscience, in our own awareness, but God is also at work in the corporate gathering of His people. You remember that the writer of Hebrews says, Forsake not the gathering of yourselves together, as a matter of some is. But as you come together, and as God is at work in your life, and in my life, He is also at work in the lives of others. I was reading the other day from Henry Blackaby's book, uh, Experiencing God, and he said, one of the things that, that he had learned and uh, I, I, I give uh, credit to Henry for some of the concepts that we'll explore today. One of the things that he has learned is that in the corporate worship, God is busy doing some things in the lives of others. And he said, there's an excitement that builds in our lives when we realize that when we come together as a group, that God is busy accomplishing some things. And if we're aware, if our eyes are open, if we see what's going on, that God is doing some things in the lives of other people. And when we recognize where he's going and what he's working with, then we decide that we can join him in becoming a part of that activity. I'm saying that to say this, that not only should we be aware of God in our quiet, private moments, and I suspect that we don't worship very well when we come to church unless we worship pretty well at home. But that's where it starts. Those private moments, those quiet moments when we're alone with God. But that's not the only place we worship. When we come together, and I, I suggested a while back that rather than spending time at church so much, and I know that there's, it's important to do that. It's important to gather. It's important to have a focus and, and to pray and so together. But rather than spending all of our time in the little holy clutches when we come to church, maybe we should prepare earlier and pray earlier and pray on the way. And then when we come to the house of God, we look around to see what God is busy doing in the lives of others. And that we would benefit greatly from, from that concept of worshiping God as we observe what God is doing. 
I wish I knew more about this. Don't you? Wouldn't you like to be an expert in worship? I doubt that any of us are, honestly. And maybe that's coming from my own frustration and inexperience as much as anything else. But what do we mean by worship? What involves us in worship? Let's continue reading. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And John in his commentary said, but he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd then answered him, we have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up. What is our focus of worship? What do we mean when we come together and say, I love God? My dad's penetrating question to me was, Son, do you love God? He knew that I had been struggling with the reality of sin in my own life. He had seen it at home. He had seen it in my kind of withdrawal from some family affairs. And, uh, I had a, a favorite hiding place. We, we stored hay at the end of the barn. And it was a long shed type barn. And we, we cut off a section of it and, and piled loose hay in there. And I found a way to to dig a tunnel under the hay and find a little private place a build a wall where I had a little bit of light coming in through a crack. And I could sit there in complete isolation. And sometimes I would sit there and wonder, what is this all about? Where am I going from here? How am I ever going to get things settled because I'm so disturbed and troubled? And my dad knew that. And he said to me, son, do you love God? Do you have a, a close, warm, trusting feeling toward God? Have you made a peaceful adjustment to God? Whatever he meant by those simple words, I took it and interpreted it to mean that that I needed to, to do something to make some accommodation to this God person that he was mentioning. Moses said, he did not quote the Ten Commandments, you notice, in the second statement of the law. He did not go through all the routine of, of ten, the Decalogue. But he said, this is the essence of it. You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And Jesus came along with a question, a similar question to an inquiring attorney. In, and he said, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your strength, with all of your mind. And let's add to it. Let's extend it. Let's perfect it. What Jesus did not adopt as from the Old Testament, he corrected it. He either commended it or he corrected it. He commended it as far as it went. And then he corrected it by extending it. And the second, he said, is likened to it. 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he made a remarkable statement. This is what the law and the prophets were all about. If you love God with every capacity God has given you, and if you love your friend and your neighbor with the same kind of devotion, you cover the whole territory. 